welcome everyone. My name is Trisha Berry. I use the she, her pronouns and welcome to our Fab Femmes Friday. Today is also Juneteenth, so I wanted to make sure that we recognize that and encourage you to use part of your day today to explore what that means and why we celebrate Juneteenth and the importance of the day. So I encourage you to take some time to do that. We've shared some resources on our social media and you can find a number of great articles and information throughout the UT social media as well about today. Today is our Fat Films Friday focus on biomedical engineering and I'm super excited that we have a fabulous array of panelists to join you today. My name is Trisha Berry. I am the director of the Women in Engineering program, your host for our Fab Films Friday. And we have a fabulous lineup throughout June and July, so I hope you continue to join us each Friday. So today what we're going to do is we're going to have a facilitated panel. We have five fabulous panelists with us, and we're also going to be taking questions from the audience. So please use that Q&A pod that you see to be able to ask questions, hit the little talk bubble button to submit those, and we'll answer those towards the end of our time. We, yes, I'm on a call. <laughs> I think we now have your destiny. <laughs> um, we also um, will have, uh, again, plenty of time for you to ask questions and we'll follow up afterwards with any questions that we are unable to answer through uh, frequently asked questions on our YouTube channel and other means. So stay tuned for that. So please ask away. So we're going to get started and we're going to start with each of our panelists introducing themselves. I could list out who they are and all of their um, fabulousness. But I'm going to let them tell you a little bit more about who they are and their background and their hometown and maybe also share with us something that they do outside of engineering, some hobby or something that gives them joy outside of, of work and outside of school. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin to start. All right. Hello, I'm Erin Lynn. I am, I currently live in Pflugerville, Texas. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm an alum of UT. Um, I have worked for GE Healthcare for 10 years now, um, doing supply chain and service. Uh, outside of work, uh, mostly I mostly spend time with my family. Uh, so I've got a husband and a two-year-old son and a Labradoodle. So husband and dog are here. So if you hear them, see them, you know, don't be surprised. Um, but then other than that, I, I enjoy also, um, exercise class. I love bar and yoga and all that stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Jazz, let's go to you. Hello, everybody. I am Jazz, a third year BME student. I am from Dallas, Texas, and my favorite hobby is... <laughs> I bet a lot can relate with you right now on that as well. <laughs> Sammy, let's hear from you. Hi, um, I'm going to be a senior this upcoming year. I am actually from Pflugerville, Texas. I went to high school there. And outside of engineering, I used to like going to live music shows, but I can't really do that much anymore. But I also love doing yoga now that I'm... Awesome. Awesome. Finding different things to do. Thanks, Sammy. Um, Dr. Cosker Fernandez, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Cosker Fernandez. I am a Texas girl, born and raised uh, just south of Houston and Lake Jackson. I went away to college and came back. I'm currently a professor in biomedical engineering here at UT Austin. Um, our research is focused on biomaterials and tissue engineering, really trying to help the body heal itself, and so that's tons of fun. Um, outside of work, I have a husband and two boys, and so I am a very proud soccer mom, which usually would take up a lot of my weekends, not right now. Um, other than that, I like to cook and read and make jewelry, so that's a new thing that you can learn about. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. We're going to keep troubleshooting with Destiny so we can try to get her, her on here to share as well. In the meantime, let me throw my first question out to Dr. Cusker of Hernandez. 
And one of the questions that came in early from our participants was really trying to understand our BME program. And we know that BME, biomedical engineering programs, are a little bit different at, at each university. So we always tell students to go and explore and see what those differences are so they can understand maybe where the best fit is. Can you share a little bit about UT's biomedical engineering program? Is it broad? Is it specialized? What does that look like? And how does that maybe impact the types of jobs or future jobs that, that graduates might have? Yeah, that's a great question. So biomedical engineering is fairly diverse. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of research that goes on in biomedical engineering. And so pretty much all departments have some aspects of each of them. And then different parts are have more prominent depending on who the researchers are there. So kind of very broadly, there's like biomaterials and tissue engineering, which is what I do. There's instrumentation, uh, for example. This would be things like making or designing new ways to do better imaging or diagnostics. Um, and then there's like biomechanics, so really understanding the biomechanical forces, mechanical, like how strong things are, how tissues interact with things. Um, and then kind of broadly across those is new approaches, so computational modeling. So UT has traditionally and is currently very strong in biomaterials and tissue engineering. And with the Odin Institute, we're very, very strong in the computational aspect of that. Um, we also also have a lot of strength in imaging and diagnostics as well. Um, one of the other, we, we have some very exciting um, work in biomechanics. It's focused more in the cardiovascular biomechanics. We don't have as much orthopedic. So the other way we could talk about things are instead of what kind of research is what kind of disease or body aspect that we're focusing on. UT is also very strong in cardiovascular, whereas we don't have as much in orthopedic in biomedical engineering. So our mechanical engineering department has a great prosthetics program. So we interface with them periodically as well. So um, those, are, those are generally what I would say is um, our research area. I would say kind of more broadly, UT does a great job of having research and faculty that are doing research that is both translational, so actually getting into the clinic, but also fundamental, like really understanding the basic principles of um, biology, physiology, the body, and how we design. So we actually marry those really, really well. Um, and so different departments will also be skewed on that spectrum as well, translational to fundamental. We tend to marry it really well at UT, so we have a number of faculty that have things in the clinic currently or are very application focused, but we also have faculty that do very fundamental aspects. So that's that's really great. Um, the other thing I would comment on is the, the partnership with Dell Medical. So with the medical school, um, our, Dell, our medical school is um, fairly new. So one of the things you also look at is um, biomedical engineering programs, like what's their affiliation with the medical school. We all almost always have an affiliation, but how close that is. We are um, very well tied to Dell Medical and continue to build partnerships between those. So I think those would be the, the key points I would, oh, and I didn't say this. Okay, cancer as well is one of our big focuses, cancer and brain health uh, are our big initiative uh, focuses in addition to the cardiovascular. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll have some additional questions that come your way about all of that as we go along. So again, participants, feel free to answer questions in the Q&A pod there, and we'll, we'll get those responded. Erin, let me come to you now. Um, since we just heard a little bit about what biomedical engineering is all about, what are some of those career options that you can have when you get that degree in biomedical engineering? Maybe you know, talk about your job a little bit. What does that look like? Maybe internships and other things that some of your peers have had off to do. Help us understand that space a little more. Sure. Um, at least when I was in school, I mean, a lot of it, there was kind of three main paths. You know, you go on to the medical school, um, or something similar path, um, go kind of further into kind of research, you know, onto a PhD sort of path, and then go into industry, um, go work for a company. Um, and so I, I, only, I went straight into industry working for GE Healthcare for my whole career. Um, so if you don't know, GE Healthcare makes um, imaging devices, medical devices. So they make CT, MRI, X-ray, 
um, as well as smaller monitoring devices, so patient monitors and ventilators, which you'll hear a lot in the news right now regarding the COVID-19. Um, so, you know, in terms of jobs, I'm most familiar with industry. Um, and so if you think about it, you can always kind of research a little bit. Med tech companies, medical device companies, um, there's really big corporations like where I work, G Healthcare, um, or orders like Medtronic or Johnson & Johnson, that they have big portfolios, lots of folks working in different areas um, of uh, product life cycle. Um, there's also a lot more smaller startup companies. There's a lot of them in Austin. Um, so that's going to be different. You might find yourself in a, in a different sort of role because those are a smaller company. Um, so I think just you can be open. There's a lot of different things you can do in the engineering degree. <laughs> I mean, I run into people um, in different functions, especially people in management and leadership that started with an engineering degree. Um, so that's one of, I think, the greatest things is that you can do a lot with it. Awesome. You might not realize when you're in high school or first starting out, but. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about maybe a project that you have done or a project that, that has gotten you really excited about, uh, you know, the future of BME maybe? Sure. I was like, one of the most um, exciting times was, you know, in my first couple of years out of college, um, um, I was part of a leadership program where a lot of times we got opportunities to do special projects and work on kind of special things. Um, and I got the opportunity to go um, to one of our manufacturing plants that makes anesthesia machines and help them through some critical times. Um, we were, you know, experiencing quality problems, you know, dealing with suppliers that were providing, you know, component parts for our very critical medical devices. Um, the quality was down and then we were trying to um, pick back up after our quality issues and ship our equipment around the world um, to hospitals that were, you know, waiting for their medical devices. Um, I got the chance to go be part of a big team um, to really kind of focus and help the, the manufacturing plants um, and deliver to their customers. Um, it was one of those times where we worked a lot, and but it was very focused on how do we how do we do this for our end customers? How do we get our hospital customers their medical equipment? So let me throw a question out to um, Dr. Cosgrove Hernandez or Aaron. Um, is it still possible to get a, a BME job after your bachelor's? Do you need to get that master's and PhD? What does that master's and PhD do for you with your career? Yeah, so this is a great question, and it's changed. So I hate to say how long ago I was a BS, a biomedical engineering student, but 20 years ago. I was a biomedical engineering student, graduated, and at that time, I knew one person in my class that went straight to industry. Now, 50%, roughly 50% of our students from a bachelor's degree get a job outside, like directly from the bachelor's degree, and then the, the remaining 50%, 50% go on to professional schools, predominantly medical school, and 50% go on to graduate schools pursuing Generally, a PhD, we have fewer master's students. Um, so really, why you choose one of those is really what kind of job you want, not in the first year, but 10 years later. Um, so there, and there are different options um, for that. So there, there's options in terms of um, different kinds of jobs in the biomedical industries. And so what you want to do kind of long term is, is really guiding what, which of those decisions you make. Thank you. Anything else you would like to add on that, Erin? Just, I mean, I'm an example of, you know, it was 10 years ago now, but I was able to get a job straight out of um, college with a bachelor's degree. So. Awesome. Lots of pathways, which is the, the good thing to note. Thank you. All right, students, Destiny, who are still trying to get on there, Jazz and Sammy, what are some things that you enjoy, some things you dislike, some of your challenges within the BME uh, program at UT Austin? Tell us about your experiences. Um, 
One of the things that I like about the BME program here is the amount of women that are in the program. I think we have 50%, which is more than some of the other majors at UT Austin. And I like that from my first year and even now, I look from my room and in the BME classes, I see the same people. So it's easier to make connections with people that you'll continue, continue to see in your classes and you can have somebody to talk to or study with and it's really convenient. And then something I dislike about the BME program is the sequentialness of our degree plan. So basically a lot of our classes have prereqs that you have to meet or co-reqs and it's very like strict almost. So if you do miss an opportunity to take a class, then it can set you back a year, which is kind of scary, I guess, to say the least. But other than that, I really enjoy the BME program here. Tammy? I agree. I agree with Jazz on both of those things. Those are really good points. I also like how small our class size is. I've had a really tight knit group of friends like since my freshman year. But I also sometimes I see our classes that are similar to the natural sciences classes. Like we have our separate statistics class and our separate physiologies. And I kind of wish that we had like more students to study with, but nothing stopping you from talking to people who are in natural sciences, also taking statistics and also taking like the physiology so you can go out and study with them. And then another good but bad thing is um, some people were talking in the Padlet about how we learn like bits and pieces of different things. BME is very interdisciplinary. And I would say that it's really interesting to learn all of these things, but sometimes that can get challenging just juggling all of the different things that we're learning. But in the end, it's definitely very beneficial for all of us. Awesome, thank you. Well, let's keep with our students here. Can We know that the engineering design process and engineering, the engineering world is full of challenges and failures. That's what helps us create better and better solutions to the challenges that are out there and to products that are out there. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some challenges or failures that you've experienced in your engineering work or school or maybe times when you felt like you didn't belong and what did you do to work through that? Um, one of the things Oh, you know. <laughs> uh, when I first joined UT, I think I was less motivated. It kind of like senioritis might have bled in a little to whenever I first started college. And then even in the beginning, I wasn't doing very well in my calculus class, which was kind of crazy to me because in high school, I was like my favorite class. Um, but I was doing pretty poorly because I wasn't studying as well as I should have. And at one point I had like a 40 in the class and I even got like an academic note that was like, oh, you should think about dropping this class. But, I, but that, at that point, that ended up like pushing me to be more motivated and I was like, no, I'm not going to drop this class. I'm going to end up like studying more. And in the end, I did end up like with a B, so that was pretty nice. And then in terms of engineering, sometimes I felt behind with my like coding experience, especially in the beginning with the intro to being in computing, there was, I think, mainly the guys in our major. For, personally, for me, I felt they had more of the coding experience. Some of them would be like, oh, I've been coding since like elementary school. And to me, I didn't have really any coding experience. So that at first was scary. But I just learned that I just had to like motivate myself to learn and that I could use like help, find help from my peers in order to get better at coding. And it was really great to push myself and know that I could do it. I had a similar experience in my coding class. I came in with no coding experience, and I remember in our first lab, everybody was working on our assignment, and there were some people finishing, like, so quickly. And I was just sitting there confused, wondering how are they doing this. But eventually, I started talking to different people in the class and trying to get better and not letting myself get down about not having the coding experience because that didn't get me anywhere. And then also when I first came in to UT, I wasn't the best at studying. And so I failed my first test here. And I was just so confused because I thought I had studied enough. I got down on myself. But I ended up talking to upperclassmen 
who have previously taken the class that I was taking, it was 10, 3 or 2, and asking them about what they did to do well in the class, and I ended up getting, like, um, finding my professor's old website with, like, some of his lecture notes and previously released tests, and I used those to study, and um, that helped me improve in the class. Awesome. So I think, you know, what I heard between, between both of you, and I don't know that you said it explicitly, but you talked about that community of support, right? You sought out others to have these conversations with, to understand that you weren't alone, and while maybe in the moment you felt like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, all me. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, there are others out there who also have felt like that. And not everyone comes in at the same, with the same learning, with the same experiences. And I will also throw out there just from a, a data standpoint, we know that our women perform really well in the School of Engineering. And you hear the guys boasting oftentimes of how easy it was, how great I did, I aced that test. And the GPA of our women tells a very different story of how our women are performing compared to our men. Our women do really well academically and oftentimes have a GPA that's a little bit higher than that of the guys. Um, so don't take that to heart. They may have said it's easy because that's what they feel like they need to say, but internally they may have been struggling just as much as you, if not more. Um, and understanding and having those conversations with others in a community can help you start to understand that, hey, this is part of it. We have to figure out how to learn differently in college. We have to figure out how to study differently. It's not the same as high school. And using those resources on campus and using each other to figure that out is really helpful. So thank you both for sharing that. Okay, let's see. I've got um, one more question that I'm going to, to throw out to Dr. Cosgrove Hernandez and to, to Aaron. What excites you? And Aaron answered this maybe a little bit, but um, you know, what excites you about the future of biomedical engineering? What do you see as these opportunities to really make our world a better place? Uh, we know that really there's that high need for problem solvers out there in our world. Aaron, would you like to go first? Sure, I can. I've got probably a different perspective. Um, you know, being in a, a, a medical device company, we're, we're very focused on delivering for our end customers, helping them deliver in the, in the moments that matter, like get take care of their customers and do it efficiently. Um, it's, it's, one of, it's a big concern right now with the, the COVID-19 and, and the, the economic um, downturn right now. There's just a lot of concerns about how do hospitals stay operationally efficient. Um, and being in the healthcare industry, that's part of our job is to, to help those customers do that. Like the idea is we help the hospitals run efficiently with good technology, good processes, um, a good understanding of how to, to use their equipment and all of that so they can take care of patients. So that's what's exciting about, you know, working in this industry, you know, especially when, you know, you, it's very relatable to sometimes some of the stuff that goes on in our world. So you're very connected. Awesome. Thank you. Can I just say everything? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I originally was choosing biomedical engineering, I, I always knew I wanted to be an engineer. I love solving problems, love figuring out how to, how to figure out how to get something done um, and improve it. But like for biomedical engineering, we are working to solve problems to help people live longer and better, right? So. And what's happening right now is the pace of biomedical engineering and just our understanding of the body is so fast that they're, we're just constantly revealing these increasingly intricate like, things about the body and how we can work with the body. And it's just opening up new and better ways for us to help people. And that's exciting and stimulating um, in terms of like the engineering and fascinating in terms of how the body works. Like, you know, we've been studying the body since, you know, for eons and like we're still uncovering like how things work. And as devastating as COVID is, like it is amazing what people are discovering 
and implementing and repurposing and figuring out that's going to, the research going on now, it's not just going to affect how COVID is, but it's going to affect um, healthcare for, for decades. And this concentrated effort is really just going to advance. And it's just really exciting to be part of that on a day-to-day -day basis and helping train students who are going to go out and make such a difference in people's lives. And I think that's to me, that's always what's been fascinating and impactful about biomedical engineering. Awesome. So given that we're talking a little bit about the future, one of the questions came in that, Daz and Sammy, what are you planning to do? What is What does your future look like at the moment, knowing that it may change a lot of times between now and graduation? Um, for me personally, I am going to industry after as far as um right now it may change i don't know but right now it's industry i am currently working on i want to go to physician's assistant school and i will be applying for that in the spring and hopefully that's what i get into and at first I wasn't sure at first I was thinking industry and then my plans had changed about around my sophomore year. So it's fine to change your mind. Yeah, and I think that's something that's important to recognize is you might come in thinking this is what I want to do and where I want to go. I wanted to go and be a sports medicine doctor when I started my engineering degree my first semester. And then I learned what medicine was all about. And I said, absolutely not. I don't want to go do that. And I completely shifted pathways to head into industry. So your path can take lots of twists and turns. Even once you get out into industry, you might do a variety of things or out into graduate school or wherever you head. So that's, that's good to remember. You don't have to all have it all figured out when you start. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Sarah Jan, our fabulous WEP crew member, student uh, that just graduated. She's part of our class of 2020, engineering class of 2020, and she's going to help drive our Q&A. You've been all submitting lots of questions, which is fantastic, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can in the next bit of time that we have. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Jan to help facilitate that. All right. Um, I will send this to Sammy and Jazz. Can you talk about um, what kind of internships y'all have had and just what internships there are uh, for BME students? Um, personally, I didn't participate in internships, but I was working as a medical assistant for preparation for physician assistant school. So I was working at like a clinic on the weekends and then personally I do know friends who have had internships um, at some some have had them at often like small often companies and I know other people who have gone to like Genentech in the Bay Area. I personally haven't had an internship but I know some people that have gotten one and they I think it was like a quality control. I'm not too sure about what they were doing. But yeah, it's different. It ranges. Yeah, there's lots of opportunities depending on what your interests are. And our Engineering Career Assistance Center is there to help connect you with those opportunities. They bring in 500 plus companies each year to interview our students and recruit our students. And then our Women in Engineering program has a lot of opportunities to try to connect students with companies and research opportunities and, and things like that as well. Have either of you done research experiences? I am working in the GLUE program next semester. Okay, and GLUE is a program that, you, that we run out of our Women in Engineering program to match a graduate student with an undergrad and in a research lab. And Sammy, you've done some? Uh, I also did it through GLUE my sophomore year, and it was actually under the College of Pharmacy, and it was also, uh, it was with cancer research, like Dr. Kalsker Fernandez was saying, it's very popular, and it was about, um, like, diff diffusivity. Awesome. The so students will get experiences in a lot of different ways, and it may not be an internship with a company, but it might also be research on campus. So there's a lot of ways to get different experiences to see what you like, what you don't like, where you might fit in, and uh, where you want to head. Awesome. Sarah Jan. Oh, Erin. 
I was just going to say, I when I was in college, I did a research experience for undergrad, so it was like just in the summer, so I didn't do it at the same time I was taking school, so I got to really deep dive into that area um, to understand what it's like to be a grad student and kind of go through PhD style research and work with a professor and grad student and other undergrads in, in a team. Um, ultimately, I, it was fun, but I decided I didn't want to do that after. <laughs> um, yeah. Which is important. It's good to learn what isn't for you while you're still in college before that's your full-time job. And those research experiences for undergrads are all across the country. Universities all across the country, all across the globe offer similar types of things. So you can take part in those during the summer at another institution, which is kind of cool. Awesome. Okay. Mary Jan. Um, uh, Dr. Koska Fernandez and Aaron, uh, could y'all talk a little bit about how your work has changed um, in the light of COVID-19? <laughs> yeah, so uh, in March, UT shut down all research um, activities in the lab and for non-COVID related research. So we're, my lab doesn't do COVID related research. So we, we were working remotely. Um, so we were focused a lot on planning research, uh, writing experiments, like really uh, thinking more deeply about uh, and learning from the literature. So we focused more on that aspect of it. Um, we are in a, partial research opening phase right now at UT, which means only 30% of our researchers can go back in the lab and there's a lot of precautions. So right now we're in a mix of doing, going back to doing experiments and then also doing, um, continuing to do remote work and work from home. And that's really thinking and studying more about the problems and coming up with plans on how to test and develop. Um, I have colleagues that do more computational work, and they're able to work more remotely more rapidly. Um, I have colleagues that have pivoted to do some research on COVID-related um, aspects, and that that's not just trying to find a vaccine. That's also like, how do we sterilize masks, or how do we, you know, create low-cost ventilators? Came out of UTBME recent or a couple months ago. Um, so it's it's. It's not just all the on the pharmaceutical side of things. It's also on a number of the other side of things, and also fundamental studies on how does COVID affect different populations differently. So really understanding how the pathogen works. Um, so so there's a variety of different ways that the shutdown has affected um, research on on UT campus. Um, we are looking forward to getting back to our, we're a wet lab, meaning that we do experiments in the lab primarily, so we're looking forward to getting back, but we're not going to do that at a pace that that is not safe for our, our researchers. I'll go. Um, so I actually always work from home. Um, if you can't see, this is my home office, and so it's all set up. It's always been like that. Um, but it definitely a big change. Uh, a lot of my colleagues work in our headquarters in Wisconsin in the office, and a lot of I work with a lot of people in the field as well. Um, people, um, sales folks that go out and talk to customers, you know, to sell them service contracts. Um, so when everything shut down, I mean, travel stopped, meetings stopped. I used to go get to meet some of my colleagues in person once uh, every couple of months. Everything stopped. Um, and a big change for everybody personally, a lot of us are parents, a lot of us, our kids were suddenly at home with us. So, you know, a lot changed, I think, in just the, the personal aspect, actually. Like, you know, we'd get on calls and meetings, and the first thing everybody would say, how's everybody doing? Like, <laughs> you know, everybody okay? So it, it's been an adjustment, um, even though the work itself for me, I do it from home, but it's a different mindset. Um, we get reminded, you know, there's the other aspect of those that are out in the field. You know, we have, like I said, salespeople and field engineers um, that go on site, and some of them, you know, had to continue to go on site. And so just hearing, you know, some of the precautions that are needed and the 
the, the, the work that's done, you know, they're kind of frontline employees too. And so me and my role, you know, a lot of my team, we're supporting them. So it's really just learning to be empathetic and one of the biggest changes. So. Thanks. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions about coding and programming. Um, so Sammy and Jazz, can y'all talk about um, the coding language y'all used at UT um, and if you recommend these students to take any classes in high school like coding? Um, when I started for the intro to computing class, I know we were doing like lower level languages. We were using something called LP3, but I know that it's changed since then. And I think Jazz can talk about that where I believe now you'll start out with Python. And then for high school, I definitely would suggest if you're able to, to do like a computer science class or to do an engineering course. I know personally, we had those at our high school, but actually not a lot of girls took them. I personally was doing more of like the medical classes, which I enjoyed. So, so far at UT, I have used used Python, C++, and that was in our intro to computing class. And then I just took my MATLAB class. And when I was in statistics, we were working in R. And as far as um, what to take in high school, I honestly don't know. I guess I would recommend a computer science class like Sandy did. We didn't have that at my high school, so I was actually kind of surprised when I um, met so many people that came in who had taken um, classes like that in high school. Okay, great. Um, sorry, we're getting a lot of questions right now. <laughs> Good job, participants. Keep Sarah Jan on her toes throwing questions at us. <laughs> And I will, I'll say again, we know that we're not going to get through all of these questions. And so we will do our best afterwards to get our students and our alums and anyone who will join us to try to make some uh, additional YouTube videos to answer questions. Um, we'll try to collect uh, as many responses as we can to share out on social media and some of our different ways. So um, please keep those questions coming in. We will do our best to, to answer those in a variety of ways afterwards if we don't get that to them today. Um, so I know some of our panelists may have touched on it, but could everyone just talk about, um, you know, how did you know that BME was for you? Erin, you want to start? <laughs> I had to put you on the spot. <laughs> sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a weird answer because I think when I was in high school and first starting, it was kind of that interest in the human body and biology and chemistry and um, just, again, of how the body works. Um, it's interesting because I don't do anything with that now. It's kind of led me in a completely different direction. Um, but, you know, something, I knew I wanted to do something, you know, engineering, kind of technical, um, use, use my intelligence, use that, you know, those skills in math and science. So. Awesome. Thank you. Jazz, what about you? I went to a web camp before my senior year, and that's what helped me choose my major. Um, I knew I wanted to do engineering, but I didn't know which one I specifically wanted to do. But I've always been fascinated with the human body and learning more about it. So I decided that um, biomedical engineering was the one for me. And so far, I do not regret my decision. Oh, um, me. So I, I got pretty interested in like medicine whenever I was in high school and then one of the classes I had taken was like health science technologies and they were talking about like artificial organs and so my interest in medicine combined with my interest in advancements in technology led me to biomedical engineering and I thought it was perfect. Awesome. Dr. Cosgrove Fernandez, what about you? Um, 
So I did, so as I said, I always knew I wanted to be an engineer. So when I was growing up, right, they told you, you're good at math and science, that means you're an engineer. And I would, I would say that's not true. Math and science are tools. To me, if you want to be an engineer, it's because you like to solve problems. We are problem solvers first and foremost. So I had, I knew that. I wanted to solve problems good. And so it was like picking which one. And I did um, a science fair project on uh, EKG and, and uh, Neurogram, like testing. It was through a local uh, um, science, so local group that I was involved in. And I went to a conference, and everyone was presenting their research, and I just loved the interactions with the doctors and, like, figuring it out and, like, that inner disciplinary part. And then, as I said, just I really wanted my work to be directly benefiting people. So I really wanted to know that what I was working on was going to help people. Um, so so that's, that's where I've been. And then there's lots of career decisions along the way, but I think those are those still remain the core aspects, which are solving problems and wanting to benefit like wanting my work to benefit people. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um Aaron and Dr. Costco Fernandez, could you talk about um like how interdisciplinary BME is and, you know, possibly working with other types of engineers or uh, industry so um, I, we BME came from a bunch of different engineering right so there was always biomedical research that was just housed in other engineering departments right so our prosthetics people come from mechanical engineering a lot of the biomaterials came from chemical engineering a lot of our imaging and diagnostics came from electrical engineering. And so we are incredibly uh, interdisciplinary with the other engineering. And then a lot of what we do is founded in chemistry and biology and, and uh, physiology. And so we interface with everything from basic scientists to other engineers. And then we interface with clinicians a lot. So you really have to be able to speak everyone's language and you're kind of, you're the one interpreting it. So I'm take, talking to a doctor and he's telling me what he wants or she's telling me what she wants and I'm translating that into engineering, right? Engineering problems. So, and then what I'm doing is then I'm looking at what, what do I need to do to solve that engineering problem and I maybe have to go then translate that engineering problem to a chemist and tell it to them in their language. So we really have to speak a lot of languages um, but I think it's just really exciting to be able to interact with such a diversity of way people think and the tools that they have. So it's it's very empowering. It, it's interesting that you talk about having to, to translate from different groups. I feel like I actually do a lot of the same with different groups, but it's a similar aspect. Um, I guess an example, I'm kind of working on working with some engineering teams that are releasing a new UPS, an uninterruptible power supply for a CT scanner. And, and they're very focused on the, you know, electrical, you know, the qualification, making sure it works with the CT scanner. And my role is in service um, to make sure that we can then provide service to hospitals and we use, we use a network of vendors, not, not our own field engineers. Um, so I, I'm working to kind of translate a lot of like the engineering specifications and what they're working through um, with you know, FDA and EHS compliance um, and also helping them see the service side of once it's at a hospital with a CT and it needs service, you know, are we going to be able to do that? Um, it's a different dynamic. <laughs> Oh, um, Sammy and Jazz, can you talk about how much chemistry plays a part in y'all's BME degree plan? Yeah, so we'll take a few chemistry classes, and then we'll take like intro chemistry, which is really interesting, and that's, you'll 
most likely take that your freshman year or some people um, test out of it with their AP class, with their AP credit. And then we also have to take organic chemistry and both the chemistry lab and the organic chemistry lab. And some people choose to take organic chemistry too and that I believe it does count towards one of um, the technical electives for one of the BME tracks, but not everyone does that. And we also take biochemistry, but that's it, I think. It's like four classes and two labs. And you can also find the degree plan on the Biomedical Engineering Department's website. That's a great thing to go and explore for those of you future students who are trying to figure out what BME is all about or what other majors are all about. You can go on the department website, look at that degree plan and see the types of classes that you take, the electives that are possible, the different tracks that are possible. And that can also help you compare different universities to see how biomedical engineering is at UT and what is offered and what are the focus areas versus other universities. Um, it's also where you can go into chemical engineering at UT Austin and see how biomedical engineering is embedded within that department in a track or where, as you heard Dr. Cosker Fernandez talking about the prosthetics and that piece fits within mechanical engineering and how that fits within that degree plan to figure out, I'm interested in biomed, but maybe I actually fit better within mechanical engineering or maybe I fit better within the BME space within chemical engineering and maybe it's within the biomedical engineering department. Exploring some of those degree plans can help you really see that a little bit better. Can I follow up on that? So, yeah, please. So, biomedical research, as, as Trisha was saying, is in all of the different engineering departments. It's, it's what else you're going to be learning about, right? So, in chemical engineering, you're also going to be learning. You will, you will have access to a lot of the tools that we use in biomedical engineering. You can do research in that. But you're also going to be learning, like, reactor design and a lot of other aspects, right? So... In, in what you really like is one part of chemical engineering, being deep in chemical engineering makes sense. Or in mechanical engineering, if you really like understanding the mechanics, then that makes sense to do mechanical engineering. Um, for biomedical engineering, as I said, it, you're going to take a bunch of different classes, but they're all going to be focused on biomed. So you're going to learn mechanics, but only as it relates to biomed. And you're going to learn, you know, a lot, you're going to learn circuits, but as it relates to biomed. And so there's a fair amount of crossover. So every every department has breadth, right? Um, and so we have breadth across the different engineering, but all focused within BME. Whereas chemical engineering, they focus it, its breadth is in its applications, right? So you have you know oil and materials and you know biological. So but the the breadth is across the applications. Does that make sense? That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I know we still have some questions that perhaps have not been answered. Again, we will work um, hard to be able to answer those in a variety of ways and share those out to our community. So if you have additional questions, throw them in there. If we did not get to your question, again, we will, we will work to respond. I'm going to wrap up with one final question out to our fabulous panelists. As we wrap up here, we know we've got some of our future engineering students on the line. We have some of our admitted engineering students who are participating virtually in orientation this summer and some of our current undergraduates who are also joining in today. What advice or words of wisdom would you like to leave with our participants before we wrap up? And I'm going to hand it over to Erin first to start. Sounds good. Uh, so my my advice is is be, be curious, ask questions. You're at an awesome point in your life where that should be your job is to learn, 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 and, and don't stop asking questions. Like you know, whenever you can, kind of reflect a little bit how you can grow and learn. Not just how do I get my math homework done, <laughs> but <laughs> actually learn because. Um, that's, that's life, you know, you want to be a good learner, keep doing it. So. 
Thank My you. Dad? would be to not be afraid of making mistakes. They help you improve in some way or another. And being scared of making a mistake holds you back and keeps you from accepting new challenges or whatever. I would say accept all the challenges that come your way and just be confident in yourself. Thank you. Sammy? Mine will be a little similar to Jazz's, but I would say that no matter what, just hang in there and that remind yourself it's okay to fail, it's okay to change paths, and no matter what, you can get through it, and it'll be great to learn and grow. Yeah. Dr. Cosper Fernandez? All of those things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we a couple, which is... Um, this is a time for you to explore, so not just prepare. We're, I, like engineers tend to be very task oriented, so we're like, I got to get these courses done, and you like get your head down, and you get it done, and you don't stop and think, is this where I want to be? Is this what I want to do? And so taking the opportunity, as Aaron said, to ask questions of of your of everyone around you to learn and explore and reflect on your path, and the, as uh, was also said, like. It is not a failure to change path, right? That is not a failure. This, your job right now is to figure out what you want to do, not next year, but also like 10 and 20 years from now. And so changing path now, don't worry about that it's too late or I've already, already done a, a, you know, I picked BiMed, but I really think I want to do chemical, like, go for it. And don't be, as Jazz said again, don't let the fear of failing hold you back. Because we do that a lot as women, I think. <laughs> so. uh, that's true. Be, learn, be bold, don't be afraid. Lots of fantastic words of wisdom there to finish us out. Thank you, panelists. That was amazing. Um, we have just a couple of things I want to remind you about as we flip back to the presentation. Next week, we have Architectural, Civil, and Environmental Engineering for our Focus for our Fab Thumbs Friday. We also encourage you to go check out fabthumbs.org. This is a STEM role model database that is led by the National Girls Collaborative Project. You can go in here and search on keywords, search on different engineering disciplines, and find other engineers to read about, connect with, and learn from. So I encourage you to check that out. I also encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. We are putting all of these videos on from our Fab Femme Fridays and posting additional content in our frequently asked questions. And again, we'll work hard to answer the questions that we did not get to today and make sure that we get those up on our YouTube channel as well. So check back frequently. We're adding video videos constantly to our YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to get notification when new videos are added. And then again, just a reminder, we'll see you next Friday. We hope you join us in the rest of July as well as we can make our way through all of the departments at UT Austin and again feature fabulous faculty and students and alumni and community partners as we move forward. So thank you again, panelists. You are amazing. Thank you for sharing your stories and your inspiration with all of our participants. And we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, everyone.